Hi everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to continue our conversation of period four. And now that we've kind of done a little detour, we've talked about kind of big picture things in the economy and the market revolution. Uh, we talked about what society was like in the Old South. Now we're going to go back to the political discussion and start talking about um, the last really major presidency that we have to talk about in period four. Um, and what this means for the United States. Um, the last president, the one we kind of left off on, was John Quincy Adams, who became president in 1824. Uh, but, of course, under dubious circumstances, or at least some would say. Um, and now we need to move forward and look at the election of 1828 and the election of Andrew Jackson to be the seventh president of the United States. An event so important to United States history that uh, we talk about this era around Jackson's presidency as the age of Jackson, right? So pretty important, and so important it goes beyond his own presidency. Um, so let's start with Andrew Jackson himself as the man, what he, who he was. We've talked about him a little bit uh, in some of these videos, but let's kind of reestablish where we're at with him, okay? Now, Two Jackson supporters who were plentiful by 1828. Andrew Jackson is absolutely a kind of ideal American, okay? Um, and Jackson, in many ways, kind of simple, symbolizes this, you know, American dream ideal that doesn't really exist yet. Uh, but is kind of in the mind of many modern Americans because Jackson truly made himself from nothing, okay? Uh, and kind of showed what you could do if you were able and ambitious and maybe a little ruthless uh, and how far along you could get. Now, Jackson himself was born in 1867, so just a few years before the outbreak of the American Revolution. He was born in a, a backcountry part of North Carolina, so, you know, near the mountains, Appalachian Mountains, close to uh, the border between North Carolina and Tennessee today. Uh, he was of Scots-Irish background. Uh, his parents were poor immigrants. Um, so not a lot uh, positive going on in er Jackson's early life. Um, he had a rough life. His uh, father passed away uh, pretty early, um, and then he was raised by his mother. Uh, during the Revolution, he actually served as like a, a spy for Patriot forces, which actually got him in trouble. And at one point, uh, uh, British Redcoat showed up at his uh, family's doorstep and had to be kind of threatened by his mother to leave. Uh, so early on, he was already becoming, you know, kind of a troublemaker in his own way. Now, uh, Jackson, as he reached adulthood, uh, would move a little further west, head to Tennessee. Uh, he became a lawyer, although completely self-taught, no real formal schooling in Jackson's background. And he also got into what a lot of up-and-coming uh, young men, uh, business, a lot of up-and-coming young men would get into land speculation, where you raise as much money as you can, buy some land that you think is very valuable, and then try to sell it to uh, folks at a higher price. Okay? Now, Jackson certainly is not like a regular dude in any way. Um, for him to make himself and eventually reach the, the office of the president, he's not a regular guy. Okay, He has a lot of talents. But he is far more like the so-called common man uh, that he will come to represent than any of the politicians of his day or those that came before him. Um, because he had that kind of common touch and he kind of understood what life was like for the average American who at that point was still very much an agricultural worker um, out near the frontiers of uh, the United States border. Um, now, when Tennessee became a state, uh, he would serve as the first representative for the state of Tennessee 
in Congress and then eventually moved up to serve as senator from the state of Tennessee. But really, that is not where he made his name as a national hero. Really, that came through his actions in the military. Um, most notably, during the War of 1812, uh, he fought against the British at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, this kind of pivotal battle, which even though it occurs after the war is technically over and the Treaty of Ghent is signed, um, it does make a lot of Americans feel very positive about the outcome of war, the War of 1812 and makes um, himself look like, uh, like, like a hero to the whole nation. Uh, but Jackson was also known for his role in fighting uh, wars with native tribes. Uh, he defeated the Creek Indians in Alabama. Uh, he will serve for a time as a military governor in Florida um, as they try to pacify the Seminole tribe in Florida. So he was a well-known Indian fighter as well in his background. Now, Jackson uh, got the nickname Old Hickory. Okay, uh, because hickory is an, a hardwood, an American hardwood, um, and it is really tough and great, great to make furniture out of because it's really, really tough, but really, really hard and sturdy. And so Jackson is kind of this backwoodsy guy, uh, is kind of given this nickname because he was a tough, a tough guy to say the very least. Now, Going back to the political story where we kind of left off, uh, we talked about the development of the first party system, so talking about the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans back, uh, back at the end of period three. Um, we see that since the election of 1800 where Federalist John Adams left uh, the presidency and was replaced by Democratic Republican Thomas Jefferson, we had seen peaceful transfers of power between different sets of leaders, okay? Now, when this was occurring in the early 1800s, um, the reality is, is that most uh, Americans couldn't vote. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about the obvious, the fact that women, uh, enslaved Africans, Na Native Americans could vote. They were not allowed to vote. But the reality is, is that white men, the majority of white men themselves couldn't vote. Why? Um, well, most states uh, at the turn of the 19th century, the 1800s, had things like property qualifications, uh, tax requirements that said you had to own a certain amount of property to get the right to vote. You had to pay a certain amount of taxes to get the right to vote. And so that means the vast majority of poor white males had voting rights, had the right to suffrage, okay? Now, before all of this is occurring and before the election of 1828, we see that a process is slowly unfolding on the state level. Um, states have an amazing amount of power to decide who are going to be voters in their states, especially during this period of American history. And what states decide to do is slowly but surely remove those property qualifications and tax restrictions, which would make it by around 1828, uh, the vast majority of white men would be able to vote. This is what we would call universal white male suffrage, okay? Um, and while we do not necessarily today look at this and be are like, wow, that's awesome, yeah, right? All, oh, wait, all the white guys can vote. You do need to realize that it is a pretty important period uh, or development in American history because it is the first time we see the franchise, the right to vote, expanded out to a new group of people. And then, of course, as time goes forward, we'll talk about the franchise being extended to black men. And then uh, when we get to the 20th century uh, in the 1920s, being extended to women. Uh, but this is really the first step in that kind of extending of democracy out to your average American. Now, this change is, though, is going to have a major impact on politics because it essentially changes how politics is done. For example... Back when he ran for president in 1796 and 1800, Thomas Jefferson campaigned 
from his home in Monticello, Virginia. He, he did not leave his house. Uh, he campaigned through writing letters to other elites in other states by having his um, kind of loyalist write articles and newspapers kind of complimenting him and saying why they should people should vote for Jefferson. But once you open up the right to vote to more folks than just those that read newspapers or even can read, right, because literacy is uh, something in short supply back in these times, you see that in order to win elections, you actually have to change how you do politics. Now, the guy who more than anyone kind of realized the need to change in the wake of universal white male suffrage was Martin Van Buren, who in time would come to serve as Jackson's second vice president. Um, and Van Buren kind of uh, pilots this plan of campaigning, and this campaigning is going to look a lot more like the political campaigns of the modern day, or at least what we would see today. So you'd have things like parades uh, focused around a candidate, rallies where uh, the candidate or other speakers would talk about him, leaflets, kind of very brief things to read uh, that say vote for Jackson or whomever, barbecues, okay, kind of getting people to come out, give them some free food and say, hey, vote for Jackson, okay? Kissing babies, all of these things that we kind of think are kind of the norm in politics today, although not in the 2020 election. Not a lot of kissing of babies going on in the 2020 election due to COVID. But the basic contours of the modern campaign begin to be developed in the 1820s, right around this time that Jackson is coming to power. Now, we talked about this uh, a few videos back but the 1824 election was a very controversial one. Um, of course, the ultimate winner was John Quincy Adams, uh, but the idea that Quincy Adams won it uh, legitimately was very much challenged by pro-Jackson supporters, which argued rightfully that Jackson got the most number of popular votes and that it was actually just a decision of the House of Representatives that named Quincy uh, Adams to be president, and that same House of Representatives was led at the time by Henry Clay, who would eventually become Quincy's Secretary of State, uh, Quincy Adams' Secretary of State. And so, in 1828, Jackson supporters, which never really you know, took their pedal off the metal since 1824, are gung-ho to unseat the incumbent, John Quincy Adams, and replace him once and for all with Andrew Jackson. Uh, as one pro-Jackson newspaper put it, to the polls, to the polls, let no one stay home, let not a vote be lost. And that is basically the way it went down. Uh, Jackson would easily win the southern states and the western states. You see the electoral map here. States in blue are ones won by Jackson. Um, you see in, uh, Adams really only performs well in New England and in the northeast uh, where he's from, uh, but pretty much everywhere he got crushed on the state level vote, and the popular vote was overwhelmingly in Jackson's favor. And so Jackson wins a pretty easy electoral victory here in 1828, and now, when he becomes president, he's going to change the office of presidency forever and begin a new era in American history and politics. Now, before we go on and talk about some of the nitty-gritty actual events of Jackson's time as president, we need to talk about what Jackson's politics were, were generally speaking. And these changes in politics and democracy um, are so tied to Jackson's time as president that we refer to them as Jacksonian democracy. We talked about a few videos ago about Jeffersonian democracy and kind of Jefferson's idea of democracy, but we're going to see this idea of Jacksonian democracy is fully formed, but is really, really unique and is a big change in what democracy looks like in America. Now, the first step is something really important to Jackson. Belief in the common man. 
Now, Jackson himself kind of being born not as an elite, not as wealthy, and kind of making himself into a wealthy man, he had a much more common touch, as we talked about. And the general belief of Jacksonians was that you could trust the common man, that they have common sense. You know, they might not have book learning or anything like that. They might not read all the newspapers. But when you present ideas to them, they come up with a good common sense solution, okay? And so Jackson, as president, um, and his admirers saw him as someone who represents the interests of those people, not the elites um, on, in East Coast cities, not the bankers and the merchants and the industrialists, but the regular guy trying to make it through each day. Uh, this is shown probably most notably in the picture here depicts uh, his uh, Jackson's inauguration at the White House, which after which his inauguration ceremony, the White House was opened up to everybody. And people from all over could just come in and walk around the White House. Um, yeah, that, that actually happened. So there was a big party at the White House when Jackson became president. The next bit is expanded suffrage. Suffrage being the right to vote. Now, as we mentioned, um, Jacksonians uh, and Jackson himself were benefits, uh, beneficiaries of uh, the growth in the right to vote. And so they generally supported more open uh, franchises, mostly to make it where all white men could vote. Again, universal white male suffrage. Right Now, this causes a change in how the parties themselves, themselves operate. Uh, we would see that during the Federalist era, the, uh, the first party system, both the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans basically chose their party leaders um, through caucuses of, of like small amounts of kind of the top, tippy top guys in each party, uh, and they decided who the candidates were. But during Jackson's time, that's going to be opened up a little bit wider. Uh, and instead, you're going to have nominating convention, conventions for the parties where people from across the United States are going to gather together to this convention and actually determine who they would like to have on their ballot representing them in uh, the presidential election. Uh, now, this is technically today more restrictive uh, than it is um than how it's decided today. Today, candidates are decided through the outcomes of primary elections across the country. But at this time, this is a more democratic way of deciding who the candidates for each party will be and comes about around the time of Jackson's presidency. Patronage is going to be a big part of Jacksonian democracy. Now, Depending on who you are, you have a different viewpoint on this, right? Now, to define patronage, this is rewarding your political supporters with government positions, okay? Now, opponents of Jackson would say that this was um, the spoil system and that Jackson, uh, by virtue of winning office, is, you know, removing competent officers from the federal government, uh, to replace them with loyalists, people loyal to Jackson, which is not untrue in the characterization there. Uh, but Jacksonians would kind of counter that with, well, we do have a duty to report our supporters, um, the opponents lost, and many of them in the government actively were uh, cri critics of Jackson, if not obstructionists to Jackson, so they ought to be removed, and that it's not such a bad thing to change out who holds political office. Uh, Jackson would call it himself rotation in office, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, what this means is that Jackson kind of sets this precedent that the party that wins gets the ability to fire members in the federal government that are not part of their party and replace them with loyal members of their political party. This is not something that we saw much earlier than Jackson, so it is tied up with Jacksonian democracy. Opposition to privileged elites. So again, uh, kind of the flip side of that belief of the common man is that Jacksonians despised 
the privileges of the Eastern elite. So in this, think, you know, again, bankers, merchants, industrialists, okay? And really, this is shown most notably through Jackson's opposition to the Bank of the United States, which we'll get into a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but essentially, the argument of the Jacksonians was that these special privileges that were given to these really wealthy elites were anathema, just completely against a government that is supposed to promote and protect the common man and their general welfare. Right? And so um, whenever anything could be seen as an elite institution or something that benefits the super wealthy in American society, Jacksonians are generally going to be against it. Now let's get into the actual nitty-gritty of some of the problems that are faced during Jackson's presidency and what Jackson's responses to them are. The first one I want to talk about is the tariff of ab abominations and the nullification crisis of 1831 and 1832. Now, first, let's talk about tariffs. Now, to quickly define what a tariff is, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. Okay, so these are goods coming into the United States from somewhere else, most likely from Europe, Britain, France, something like that, into the United States to be sold to consumers. Okay, now um, they uh, these tariffs were intended, especially in early American history, to one raise money. Right, so they are taxes; they're there to give the government money to do stuff. Uh, pay for the military or whatever they're going to do with that money, but also to act as protection to the early industries growing, particularly in the American Northeast. Now, we've talked about tariffs. Uh, Hamilton and his financial plan proposed tariffs, although they didn't get passed. But we also talked about tariffs a little while back when we talked about Henry Clay's American system, uh, which would actually propose and actually pass through Congress tariffs to raise money and protect northern industry. And the one passed in 1816 uh, was a, ta a tariff on, of, on average, about 25% of the value of imported goods. So whatever that imported good was worth, take 25% of the value, put that on top, and that's how much an American is paying in taxes to buy that imported good. Okay? Now, in the wake of, uh, or in the same election year as Jackson becomes president, 1828, Congress will pass, and it's really kind of a surprise that this happens, a protective tariff that will essentially push that rate to over 50%. So, Basically, for every good you buy from overseas, you're going to take half that price and then pay that much more on top of it, okay? Now, this leads to a lot of anger, particularly in the American South, okay? Because the Southerners, who did not have a large and growing industrial sector, as we talked about in the last video did not necessarily see the benefits of the tariff. And in most part, they're seeing the detriments of it because they're still needing to buy manufactured goods. So they buy those manufactured goods, at least in part, from foreign countries like Britain and France. Whereas in the Northeast, where there is more access to industry and more access, therefore, to in manufactured goods, they are not really paying uh, so much in tariffs and more they're getting the benefit of that tariff protection, okay? Now, in the South, planters would argue that this is something that's only helping the Northeast, and it's harming the South. Uh, because the South, you know what? They have to sell their goods on the global market. Cotton, there's too much cotton being produced. They have to sell it to the English and the French and whatnot. And so they are paying the burden of these tariffs, and then... Uh, the reality is, is that perhaps Britain and France could put their own tariffs on American goods like cotton, right? That could also come back and bite the planters in the butt. And so there's a lot of anger across the South, but again, it is kind of centered in the state of South Carolina. And that is where John C. Calhoun comes in. Now, we have spoke about John C. Calhoun a few times now, uh, first as a leader of the Warhawks faction before the War of 1812. We talked about his role as kind of a promoter of the institution of slavery in the South as a positive good. 
But during this time period, uh, during Jackson's first term as president, John C. Calhoun is serving as vice president. Now, John C. Calhoun's a politician from South Carolina, and he is very anti-tariff. Um, and he will anonymously, to begin, uh, respond to this tariff of abominations by writing a piece called the South Carolina Exposition in Protest, uh, which goes viral in South Carolina. Now, the main gist of this document is that Calhoun takes states' rights arguments that we saw first in the uh, Virginia and Kentucky resolves or resolutions written by uh, Jefferson and Madison in the wake of the Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. Um, and he kind of takes that argument that states should have a right to ignore or nullify federal laws when they are seen as unjust and applies that theory of states' rights to the tariff of abominations, as he would call it. Now, the way that Calhoun conceptualize the Union was not a union of the American people, right? That uh, we as the American people don't give up our power to the federal government, but rather we uh, are represented in the federal government by the sovereign states, in this case, his home state of South Carolina. Now, of course, within South Carolina, the people are represented in their government, but there's, there's a, 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 a skip there, right? Whereas in uh, the alternate view, the people uh, are beholden to the federal government the Constitution, and uh, Calhoun's view, the people of South Carolina are beholden to the government of South Carolina, and then the government of South Carolina is, at least in theory, beholden to the, con uh, to the government of the federal government, but not in cases like this where something clearly wrong is being done to the states. And so, again, what J uh, Calhoun would argue is that, well, if a federal law exceeded the powers of Congress, which... Calhoun argued the tariff did, that states should just declare that law null and void, right? Just not, like it doesn't exist. Now, in response to this, the legislature of South Carolina will adopt an ordinance of nullification saying we're not going to pay the tariff of abominations. Okay, there you go, right? We're not going to have tax collectors collecting this money. We're going to just, you know, act like the tariff doesn't exist at all. Now, Jackson, as far as his own political beliefs go, he was far more supported in the South and the West uh, by common men. Uh, he was a Southerner himself. So you would think that he would at least be sympathetic to the states' rights argument, but that is absolutely not the case. Instead, in this battle, Jackson stands up for the primacy of, the superiority of the federal government in these issues as the Constitution dictates, which says the Constitution uh, and therefore the federal government is the supreme law of the land. Now, Jackson would talk about this being an impractical, impractical absurdity, okay, that you can't just let the states make their own decisions on federal laws because once you start here, what's next and you know what laws will be ignored in other states. And argued that South Carolina may be committing treason, right? Uh, disunion by armed force is treason. And so Jackson, uh, again, with his own military background, says, listen, we're going to nip this in the bud, and he pushes through Congress a so-called force bill that would allow him to send the U.S. military to South Carolina to make sure federal laws like the tariff are enforced, Okay, now things are really, really heating up as we go from the winter of 1831 into 1832, and into the breach steps Henry Clay, the great compromiser, yet again, who says, okay, listen, let's, let's do a compromise tariff, and they had a tariff that greatly reduced those duties much lower than 50% over the next 10 years. Uh, and South Carolina, kind of realizing they may have stepped in it a little bit, South Carolina says, okay, fine, okay, fine, we're good, we're going to rescind our nullification ordinance, we'll collect the tariff, it's all good, this, this is over, don't send the army down, we, we don't want that to happen, okay? Now, in the end, 
this event has a lot more importance to us as students of American history for what it comes later, right? Now, I want to be clear on this. In this moment, Calhoun does not argue that South Carolina should secede or leave the Union, okay? That is not part of his argument at this point in time. Instead, he looked at nullification as a way to kind of maintain unity. That, listen, if there's some real big issue, just let South Carolina ignore the law, and that way, you know, we could just act like whatever and chill and everything's good. Uh, we don't have to have a big fight over this, okay? And certainly Calhoun uh, did not uh, foresee Jackson taking such a strong position on this, right? Now, Jackson himself would believe for the rest of his life that, in fact, he should have done more to suppress nullification. Um, and uh, he said during the fight that he would go down himself to South Carolina and hang Calhoun from the nearest tree, his, his own vice president, by the way, uh, and soon Calhoun's not going to be his vice president because he's going to quit, um, which makes sense. And then on his deathbed in 1845, Jackson he says his like final and biggest regret was that he did not execute John C. Calhoun for treason. He said, my country would have sustained me in the act and his fate would have been a warning to traitors in all time to come. Whoa, okay? Yeah, he didn't really play too much, to say the least. Now, the thing is, is that Jackson, who passes away in 1845, um, is kind of on the leading edge of a real issue here, okay? Um, because we see that in later decades, and particularly the 1850s, uh, the so-called fire eaters, the kind of firebrands, you know, big talkers in South Carolina politics start uh, saying, well, you know what, we're not just going to worry about nullification, we're just going to secede from the Union if we have a problem with the federal government. And where this issue of the tariff is something that is some that sides can compromise on in Congress, that no one feels so strongly to have a civil war over at this point, when we get to a much more thorny issue over the expansion of slavery into the West and the existence of the institution of slavery period in the United States, we're going to find that, no, that is not going to be something that we compromise on and that ultimately the leaders of South Carolina and the other southern slaveholding states, or at least most of them, determine that secession and leaving the Union is their best path for liberty, um, which, of course, is the... Uh, crux of the beginning of the American Civil War. So in many ways, this nullification crisis kind of gives us a preview of what's going to come, and both sides kind of see an example to follow during the Civil War. Uh, South Carolinians and other Southern Confederates kind of look at the example of South Carolina that in this tariff of abominations, uh, but then Abraham Lincoln himself, looking at a member of another party, the Democratic Party, does look to Jack, Andrew Jackson's um, precedent here as kind of a base to build upon his response in the American Civil War. Now let's move on to another major controversy of Jackson's time, uh, and one of the probably most notable controversies of Andrew Jackson today in the modern day, his treatment of Native Americans. Now, we're going to start around the late 1820s, around when Jackson becomes president in 1828. Um, at that time, uh, there was about 125,000 Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River, most of them in the southeast, as we would call it today, so Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida. Okay. Now, Americans generally respected uh, natives, at least as an ideal, okay? Like, oh, these people, you know, they're unique to the Americas. But when it actually came to push and shove and the fact that these natives were sitting on potentially very profitable lands for farming or mining, 
uh, white settlers would, you know, surround those lands and sometimes actually infiltrate and settle on those lands in clear violation of treaties set up between these tribes and the federal government. Now, this comes to a head most notably in 1828 right here in the state of Georgia, uh, where in Dahlonega, Georgia, gold is found becoming the first gold strike and gold rush in American history right here in Dahlonega. Although today, if you go visit Dahlonega, um, they have all the gold tourism stuff, but you're not really going to find any gold anymore. It's all gone, okay? Now, there was one problem. Dahlonega, the area around it, uh, up into the mountains of North Georgia and as far south as where Petrie Ridge High School is, was Cherokee land. And most of it was protected under treaty with the federal government. Now, the state of Georgia asked Jackson and Congress to do something about this. And Jackson, responding to his supporters in the state of Georgia and elsewhere through the South, will direct Congress to push through the Indian Removal Act in 1830. Now, what this would do is it would uh, institute a trade of native lands in the east, mostly in the southeast, for government lands in the newly established Indian Territory, what is today Oklahoma. Now, the deal was that this would be a deal for all time and that these reservations and uh, land grants out in the Indian Territory would be protected forever. Of course, that is not the way it plays out, but at least that is the selling point at that point in time. The thing is, though, is that the tribes of the Southeast are going to push back, all right? Um, most notably, the Cherokee. Now, the thing about the five major tribes in the Southeast, uh, so you have the Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, and the Choctaw, okay? Those are the five civilized tribes, as they call them is that they were far more advanced than the native tribes that we talked about, say, during the era of colonization. These tribes had, had benefited from the cultural diffusion of many things from uh, white uh, European settlement, had established many of those things for their own ends, and for example, the Cherokee, they had, you know, an elected democratic government. They had an alphabet, a written alphabet for their, their language. Uh, they used modern farming techniques that in many ways were more advanced than the ones that American settlers were using. And they were no longer dedicated to war as the only form of resistance. And in fact, the Cherokee, in response to the, uh, uh, Indian Removal Act will not go to war with the government of the United States, but instead they sue. Okay? Now, there were two cases related to the Cherokee and the Indian Removal Act. The first case, uh, Cherokee Nation uh, versus Georgia, was thrown out by the Supreme Court on the argument that a tribe did not have standing in court to sue, meaning that they, they could not sue in our American legal system. Instead, it had to be an American citizen who instituted a lawsuit, okay? And so the second case is the more important one for our purposes, the case of Worcester v. Georgia. Now, Worcester was a white settler in Georgia who lived by the permission and uh, allowance of the Cherokee to live in the Cherokee territory in North Georgia uh, in clear violation of Georgia law, okay? And so the Cherokee would use Worcester as a challenge to not just the new laws that Georgia's trying to put on them to remove the natives, but also a challenge to the Indian Removal Act itself. And so... What the Cherokee argue is that Worcester, if he's allowed to live there by Cherokee rules and laws, he should be allowed to live there because the treaties that the Cherokee signed with the federal government bound the federal government to respect the autonomy of, um, of native tribes like the Cherokee. Okay, And so the idea is, is that the Supreme Court could decide that the treaty um, should protect the natives from any sort of law to try and remove them, all right? And in this case, the Supreme Court, still under the leadership of Chief Justice John Marshall, 
would side with the Cherokee, saying, yes, the treaties the Cherokee have uh, provide them autonomy, and they ought to be able to stay, right? The reality is, though, is that in our system of government, the judicial branch, led by the Supreme Court, does determine the constitutionality of laws, okay? And what they say here is that ending removal and other laws on the state level in Georgia are, are not constitutional, right? They, they violate these treaties that are set up through the proper process with the Cherokee. But the judicial branch can't actually make sure that those rules are followed. That designation goes to, in our system, the executive branch, who is led by the president, in this case, Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson, as we spoke about before, was partially, in his earlier career before being president, an Indian fighter. He had fought in very brutal wars against the Creek in Alabama, the Seminole in Florida, and he had not too great of an impression of natives um, in, his, uh, in his own mind. And so, when Jackson heard about this decision, he gave something that was, and this might be apocryphal, might not be exactly what Jackson said, but it certainly captures what Jackson would end up doing, and he said of the decision, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Basically, he's saying, listen, the Supreme Court's decided, Marshall's decided, but who's going to enforce it? Oh, wait, that's me, I'm the president, and I'm not going to enforce what he said. Yeah. And so, this leads, ultimately, to the removal of the five civilized tribes from the American Southeast. Okay, um, they go forward with the removal of the Indians anyway. Okay, now you might be asking yourself, quite simply, how can he get away with that? How can he just do that? That's not what he's supposed to do. But the reality is, is that in this time period, while there are some folks that uh, care about the well-being of the natives, the vast majority of Americans do not, and. His opponents, Jackson's opponents, who we'll talk a little bit more about later, if anything, they are much more concerned about Jackson's overreach of federal power and kind of him doing this than they are any sort of humanitarian concern for the native tribes. Now, it takes a while to actually begin the evacuation. It wouldn't be until 1838, and actually that's during the presidency of Jackson's successor, Martin Van Buren, as president, uh, but it does begin... Uh, with army forcibly removing uh, uh, natives from their homes. Now, this happens to all five of the civilized tribes, but the one that is focused most on in American history is the removal of the Cherokee, because their removal was the most traumatic. Okay, um, The Cherokee were taken by troops uh, under General Wilfield Scott, uh, a war hero, soon to come war hero uh, in period five, um, uh, leading about 17,000 Cherokees from North Georgia towards Oklahoma. Now, the army is poorly equipped to feed and shelter these natives. Uh, uh, diseases like smallpox are rampant on the trip, and uh, natives are dying at alarming rates. Uh, about one-fourth of the Cherokee will die during the trip of disease or exhaustion. Uh, so, uh, you know, only about... Three quarters of that 17,000 actually make it to Oklahoma, the 800 miles uh, through North Georgia, Tennessee, um, Arkansas into Oklahoma that we call the Trail of Tears. Um, again, this is not the only forcible removal of natives, but because it is the most traumatic, this is the one that's remembered, but to be quite clear, the Trail of Tears narrowly refers to the movement of the Cherokee, not all of the tribes, to Oklahoma. But it is a very seminal and heartbreaking event in U.S. history. Uh, so then again, you see here on the map where they're going, again, that red route through Tennessee, through Kentucky, uh, parts of Missouri, Arkansas, and then to the Indian Territory, or what is today uh, Oklahoma. But the others in the southwest were also moved, as well as some tribes in the what we would call the Midwest. Now let's move forward to another controversy dealing with the Bank of the United States. Now as recap, we talked about the foundation of 
the second bank of the United States under Henry Clay's American system, which was approached in 1816. Of course, it's the second bank of the United States because Jefferson allowed the charter of the first bank to lapse, but during the period of the era of good feelings, there was general agreement among politicians that a bank was a good thing to have. And so it was part of his American system. Now, what did this bank do? Well, it held about $10 million in federal money, a lot of it uh, collected through tariffs, and it would use this money as loans to state banks. Now, because the state banks had all these loans from the Bank of the United States, it forced them to try and be smart when they issued loans. So uh, the small banks want to be able to pay off their, their debts to the national bank, and so they don't lend money out to just anyone. They try to lend out to folks they think will pay back their debts. Okay, And then the banks would lend out their money to individuals uh, in their own states or businesses in their states or even local governments to make uh, roads, canals uh, during the market revolution, factories in the northeast, farms in the south and the west. So there you go. Money goes down to them. Now, the second bank of the United States, by the time Jackson becomes president, um, was, was expansive. Uh, it had 25 branches across the, the nation, um, and so they are present in every single state. Um, now, Jackson uh, was fundamentally opposed to the bank because he tied it into this opposition against elites. And he would say the bank is a monster, oftentimes depicted in pro-Jackson political cartoons as the hydra, the many-headed hydra of Greek myth that, you know, when you cut one head of the hydra off, two will sprout in its place. And so you have to go to the root to kill the hydra, and you have to kill the bank where it was. Now, the thing is, is that the bank was originally chartered in 1816. So in 1836, the charter would run out, right? Now, as part of an election play in 1832, as Jackson is gearing for re-election, Henry Clay, uh, still in the House, will push through a rechartering of the National Bank, kind of as a way to attack Jackson, because he thinks, you know, there's a lot of support for his National Bank, um, and he's going to, you know, try and force Jackson to do something stupid with the bank, like veto it, right? Well, that's exactly what Jackson would do in July of 1832. He vetoes that bill that would recharter the bank for another 20 years after 1836. And Jackson himself will start to use it as an election issue, and he denounced the bank, and he says that it's used by the rich and powerful to bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes, now, this becomes a major campaign issue between Jackson running again as president and his primary rival, Henry Clay, running as his opponent. And it doesn't quite work out the way that Clay wanted. Okay, um, Instead, Jackson wins re-election in 1832, um, and Jackson kills the bank shortly after winning re-election. Uh, he basically takes all the money out of the National Bank and moves it into his so-called pet st state banks uh, that would take this money, and now that they weren't really beholden to any national bank, they make loans to all kinds of people. And while some of those loans are profitable, uh, they are in many cases speculative loans where they give money to folks that might make a lot of money, but also might have a big loss. And so as you have a boom in building of canals and other transportation projects, buying of land in the West, we see that banks make a little too many loans that don't get paid back. And eventually, within a few years of Jackson leaving office, we have a massive economic downturn due to the ending of the uh, Second Bank of the U.S., uh, but because Jackson himself is no longer president when that happens, he doesn't really take too much of the grief from that. But his successor, President Martin Van Buren, is going to be remembered as Martin v Van Ruin due to the economic problems of the late 1830s that were actually Jackson's doing. But 
In the bigger picture, we also see that Jackson's position in this bank war is going to, once and for all, reestablished a two-party system, and a two-party system that, with changes, has existed since the 1830s. Now, Jackson's party, which Jackson technically took over Jefferson's Democratic-Republican party, but now has kind of taken it in a whole different direction, uh, will be renamed the Democratic Party. And yes, you may be wondering, is that the Democratic Party of today, you know, led by uh, Joe Biden or Barack Obama, Nancy Pelosi? Yes, it is, at least in name, although the Democratic Party of the 1830s and the uh, modern Democratic Party of 2020 have a lot not in common. They are not the same party in anything but name. But they do still have the same symbol. Uh, the Democratic Party symbol is the donkey, which came about through Jackson's time because in political cartoons, uh, Jackson was depicted as a jackass, which Jackson said, hey, you know what? We'll just make that the symbol of our party. That's why the Democrats are the donkeys. Now, this organization, though, does not only happen on Jackson's supporter side, but Jackson's opponents, guys like Henry Clay, will also organize into a new political party. Okay, Now, this political party is no longer around, but the Whig Party, uh, which was formed with a lot of former Federalist supporters, also comes about during Jackson's time as president as a major supporter of the bank. They were called the Whigs, um, in reference to the British Whig Party, which was the anti-King Party, the one, the party that went against, generally speaking, the King's policies, and that had a big uh, tie to the way that these Whigs perceived Jackson. They perceived Jackson like this, as a king. Okay, a king uh, who uses his veto power too much. You see the veto in Jackson's left hand there. And you can't really tell, but down below he is standing on the uh, Constitution of the United States, kind of dirtying it with his feet. Okay? Now, the Whigs formed during the crises of Jackson's presidency. Uh, the nullification crisis, the Indian Removal Act, and the Bank War um, kind of began to split uh, the remaining Democratic-Republican Party into these two factions, one, the Democratic Party led by Jackson, and then the other, the Whig Party led by guys like Henry Clay, all right, who called uh, Jackson King Andrew I, saying, you know, he has many dubious distinctions, like using the veto power more than all the presidents before him combined use it. And actually, it would be about 100 years before we got a president that would use the veto as much as Jackson did. Okay? So Jackson's rivals, they left his party because Jackson kind of took over what was left of the Democratic-Republican Party and started remaking his own image. And those guys, they left, and they said, listen, we're going to go make our own thing the Whig Party, okay? Now, in 1836, Jackson served his two terms, so he's going to step aside in politics. Uh, but the Democratic uh, Party, now, you know, fully Jacksonized, will go right ahead and nominate Jackson's vice president, the kind of guy who conceptualized all these new campaign ideas for Jackson's party, Martin Van Buren, to be the president, okay? Now, the Whigs in 1836 did not hold a convention. They were not really organized well enough to do so, but they had a different plan. The idea was, was to kind of recreate the election of 1824 and have many other candidates, as many as th three other candidates other than Van Buren, that would basically make it where the election would not be decided by the Electoral College, but instead by the House of Representatives, which Clay had a lot of influence in. It didn't work. Um, Jackson uh, gives enough of his supporters over to Van Buren that uh, Jackson guys very happily will support Van Buren, even though he's not Andrew Jackson in any way. And so Van Buren wins a pretty solid electoral victory in 1836. Okay? But then the other shoe drops, right? Right? 
Now, during this period, there was a big economic boom during Jackson's time that had a lot to do with the fact that all that money was going to those pet state banks. But as I mentioned, just a couple months after Van Buren became president, we see a that speculative bubble burst. Um, it starts first with cotton prices dropping, right? Uh, which, uh, can, uh, when you add that with the failure of a wheat crop, we have a financial panic, okay? Now, all of a sudden, those people who were land speculators trying to sell land to other people don't really have buyers for that land, and the value of that land is much less than those speculators imagined. States cancel transportation projects, and many of these pet state banks where that federal money had been moved to just completely fail. And so we enter a major financial panic uh, in 1837 that is going to last about the next six years. And so that is really going to just doom Van Buren's presidency right from the jump. And again, uh, his nickname from his opponents in the Whig Party was Martin Van Ruen. So yeah, not too good of a legacy there for our eighth president. Okay. Now, there are connections further on in history, and one that you're probably aware of, even though we haven't talked about it in class, is the election of 1828, or 1928, sorry, wrong election, 1928. Um, now, when he ran for office in 1928, Herbert Hoover was the um, uh, third in, of uh, a line of Republican presidents who had had very uh, uh, advantageous uh, economic environment in the 1920s where we had a huge economic boom. But by September and October of uh, 1929, we see that boom turn into bust and a huge outbreak of unemployment, bank closures, uh, business failures. That was the beginning of what we call the Great Depression. And so Hoover, much like Van Buren, is a very similar guy that he doesn't really even get a chance to, to do much as president because he's dealing with this economic crisis, and right off the bat, people don't trust him to fix it, even though in Hoover's case and in Van Buren's case, the conditions that were created came before their presidency, but Americans don't really have long attention spans, to say the least. Now, this brings us up to 1840, okay? Now, in 1840, the Democrats, even though Van Buren is kind of a damaged candidate as president, they don't really feel like they have another option. So they renominate Van Buren as the incumbent to run for president again. But since 1836, the Whigs have kind of gotten their stuff together, okay? And they say, listen, okay, we're going to have a nominating convention, and we're going to find our guy. And they find a guy that is at least in some ways Jacksonian. Right, and they nominate William Henry Harrison of Ohio. Now, William Henry Harrison was a former military leader. He won very decisively against um, Tecumseh and his Confederacy in the uh, 1811 Battle of Tippecanoe, hence why he was given the nickname Tippecanoe to connect into this battle. Um, and H Harrison and the Whigs would hit Van Ruin for the economic collapse. And so Tippecanoe and Tyler II, one of their nicknames, uh, campaign slogans, would win a dominant victory over Van Buren and the Democrats in the 1840 presidential election, making Harrison the first Whig president um, and a change again in parties, okay? Now, the thing is, is that Harrison is not quite Jacksonian because Harrison was born into wealth. His father was a prominent Virginia planter. He signed the Declaration of Independence. But that's not how Harrison runs, okay? The Whigs run a campaign that's often called the Log Cabin and Hard Cider Campaign, representing the common man, especially out in the West, right? And so even though... Harrison himself is not uh, kind of a, a self-made man like Jackson. He sure does run that way, and he runs for the support of those people. And so what we see is that for the first time, both the uh, Democrats who have been doing this for a few election cycles now, but now this newly formed Whig Party are running as 
uh, modern parties appealing to the regular voting masses, trying to get regular common men to vote, right? So even the Whigs now realize that they have to change how they campaign in order to win elections and go at the common man to try and win. So they copy all those campaign tactics that Van Buren revolutionized in the 1820s to defeat him in 1840. Now, before we wrap up, let's talk a little bit and compare the Whigs and the Democrats, okay? Now, this is kind of picking us up on that graphic where we left off with the arrow of good feelings, where for a brief amount of time, there is no two-party system. There's only a one-party system. Well, of course, as you have seen, Jackson's presidency changes that forever, and from Jackson's presidency forward, we are going to have two parties in American national politics. Now, of course, the Democratic Party is the side that kind of goes with Jackson. Jackson kind of reforms Jefferson's party in his own image, on his own beliefs, okay? Whereas those Jackson opponents split off and make the new party, the Whig Party, okay? And so we see that uh, the Democratic Party, um, uh, generally speaking, supports uh, the South and West and smaller states and states' rights, generally speaking, where the Whigs are more supported in the Northeast, more uh, supported by industrialists, merchants, and uh, is more focused on the development of the federal government, okay? Now, again, the Whigs support a strong federal government over state governments. Uh, they take that idea of a loose construction of the Constitution using that elastic clause, saying that as long as the, um, it's not specifically prohibited in the Constitution, Congress should be able to pass laws about it. Uh, they support the second national bank, and they support Clay's American system, right? And these are all things that Jackson opposes, which is why they end up in this party anyway. They also look at actions of the Democratic Party under Jackson, like the spoil system, Indian removal, and Western expansion, kind of negatively. Now, we talked about Henry Clay, one of their key leaders. Another one I do want to emphasize is this guy, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, uh, who also arises as a key leader for the Whig parties in their brief history. Uh, where are the Whigs most supported? Small businessmen, professionals, and, uh, you know, so think lawyers, uh, physicians, things like that, manufacturers and industrial interests, and then some Southern planters also would identify with the Whig Party. Now, on the flip side, the Democratic Party broadly supports the doctrine of states' rights, even though Jackson himself kind of went against it in the Tariff of Abominations fight. Uh, they support a strict construction of the Constitution, so unless it's specifically in there, Congress can't pass a law about it. They support Indian removal, and they do support Western expansion moving further and further west with the ultimate goal of perhaps making it to the Pacific Ocean, which is something we'll talk a lot more about in the beginning of Period 5. Democrats strongly oppose the Second National Bank, and they oppose federal support for Clay's American system. They don't dislike canals and railroads and all these things, but they don't think that should be done on a federal level. Instead, states should finance that by themselves if they want that. Key leaders of the Democrats would, of course, be Andrew Jackson, then Martin Van Buren. Where are the Democrats most supported? They're supported by the growing group of Irish immigrants, okay? They are supported by uh, poor farmers in both the North and the Midwest, smaller planters in the South, skilled and unskilled workers everywhere in cities and towns, and anyone that would consider themselves the common man, right? Which is in, in quotes there because that's a lot of folks could potentially consider themselves the common man. Okay, we're going to leave it there for today. I know that was a long one, but there's a lot of stuff about Jackson, but that is it. We're good with Jackson. And so next time we're going to come back and finish up uh, period four, talking about some cultural changes in the United States, uh, some reform movements, some art, uh, some literature. Uh, but for now, we'll leave it there and we'll see you next time. Bye.